Hello, my name is Serena Sanchez. I'm the writer and creator of Black Rhapsody. You can find it on Indiegogo. You can also find me on Twitter at Magic Almia. And this is Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented comic writer. She is the creator of Black Rhapsody. We are here today to welcome Serena Sanchez. How are you doing today, Serena? Uh, I'm doing good. Thanks for having me on. Oh, thanks for coming on the show. I greatly appreciate it. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking, tell us who you are and, and what you've created. I want to talk about my comic project, Black Rhapsody. I launched it last Saturday and I'm now funded, which I'm happy about. The comic about the horror culture about musical magical girls in a a pill fight against a Lacrosian pop star in her evil music empire. But isn't that just the regular music empire as we see it today, anyhow? Yeah, so basically it's based on a true story, just with <laughs> like magical creatures. There you go. You have beautiful artwork from what I've seen as well, too. Who is the the artist that is working with you, or artists, I should say, that are working with you on this? The artist on Black Rhapsody is Jan Apple. I found her through ArtStation and emailed her. I like the uh, manga style. Because I always imagine Black Rhapsody being a manga, uh, manga inspired book. The fact that she, like her also complemented themes of my story very well. And what are some of the themes of your, your comic and story? Personal responsibility. Don't mess with the gods. How music affects people. Don't mess with the gods. Survival in a harsh cutthroat industry. So don't mess with the gods. You know, stuff like that. Why the Lovecraftian horror genre, uh, especially with your, your comic? Was there anything that you love about that type of genre? Yeah, I always been a fan of like Lovecraftian creature designs and atmospheric horror. Because that's going to get me scared a lot quicker than something with jump scares or loud noises. And since Black Rhapsody is like a comic... I want to see if I could convey that same horror through my writing. What are some of the misunderstood aspects about horror that people maybe don't quite understand? Less about, you know, loud noises and, you know, simple spooks and more about like tone, atmosphere, and the fear of the unknown. That's why I would say that's more better of the horror because some horror movies nowadays don't really seem to understand that. The more you tell us about the monster, the more you show the monster, the less scary it is. As a writer yourself, what is the hardest part about writing? Is it the beginning, the middle, or the end of your process? I think it's all three. <laughs> I'm, I'm someone who has a bit of a stream of consciousness when it comes to writing. So while I'm writing, I'll come up with a different idea or a different story tale that I want to take instead of what I'm currently writing at the moment. Because there were times where I had to constantly keep changing things. And as a result, I ended up on my first draft, I created a like Frankenstein of set pieces rather than having them all be like tied together in some way. What has been the response to your comic then? It's been like a very positive response. A lot of people like the premise and the art. Is anyone saying anything about the characters themselves or about the world that you've created? A lot of people like the character of Alethea. <laughs> At least from what I described of her. She's the goth chick with the um, brown eyes. I remember showing my friends a piece of my script that kicks off the entire story of Black Crafts. They just couldn't help but laugh because, yeah, of course she would do that <laughs> type of moment. <laughs> You know, you touched on the names of one of your characters. Now, I always find nameology pretty fascinating when it comes to character creation because that kind of sets the tone for the world that you've built. Tell us about how you came up with the, with the names of your characters. I use um, behind the names to kind of like look up names of characters. I, I, I'm someone who likes to give my, give my characters like unique and exotic sounding names because it helps them stand out. With Alethea, I chose I chose her name because it means truth in Greek. Hmm. And Althea is someone who doesn't like hold back. She's very like brutally honest. I would say that's kind of what you know leads to the events of the story. And you also show the antagonist as well, too. Tell us about about her. I mean, she seems like she's really evil and conniving, but uh, also uh 
would be a, a pretty badass character to create. Yeah, Disabella's process was kind of the more difficult because I didn't know what I want her to look like. Plus, I had a impression of her character in my head, just finding what she looks like. I chose the name because it sounded like the most pop star-ish. It, <laughs> it, and I found it like something like Cher like, or Madonna. The one name, the one name singers that are iconic in today's lexicon of music, yeah. Yeah, but also having the biggest egos. Like, what would happen if you had, like, a DD from the past come to our modern world and they became a pop star? How would they react to other talents? And the question is, not very well, especially when potential talents uh, disrespect them. And so I say, don't disrespect the gods. Does writing creatively energize you or does it, you know, sap you of energy? Energizing me in certain moments. I have to be in the mood to write. Mm -hmm. At times, where I have to be heavily inspired by something to want to write a scene. With the first beginning half of Black Rhapsody, I, I kept changing the beginning just due to the fact that I was trying to figure out what is the best hook to start the story on. So I spent most of my time reading comics and manga trying to figure that out. And it gave me a lot of inspiration to write certain scenes. Looking at the script then and, and working with the artist as you as you have here, especially for this this first issue, was there a scene in your script that you wrote down that when you finally got to see the art, you were blown away by it? Yes. Oh my God. Oh, that's there's so many scenes. <laughs> I guess the one with the guitar that I sent you that's mm -hmm. in the background of me. That was probably my most favorite. That and the um, scene when the girl is running. Because the way Jan captured that, oh my God. That that was my moneymaker right there. <laughs> I got a lot of signups when I showed that piece on shows. Everyone liked it. I think it's because of the guitar, but that's just me. No, they, they were beautifully drawn. I mean, the, the especially you, you see a lot of comics these days don't really do too much motion unless it's like an action-based type comic you know you're allowing the artist to show the art it, rather than covering it with dialogue at least from the scenes i've seen are is just incredible i love seeing that yeah some of the pages well most of the pages aren't lettered yet so it's just going to be the comic pages as of right now have you been writing long like writing my own projects and creatively not yeah. as long i went to college for creative writing, which has helped me building the basis for Black Rhapsody. That was like two, three years ago. You have a comic made though. That's the best part about your, your creative process, right? Mm -hmm. What were some of the lessons that you learned in your process, creating the, the initial idea of the script itself to its current form? You know, what, what lessons did you learn along the way? Uh, differentiating character voice because when my first draft, the characters all sounded the same. My issue was that I didn't convey their personalities enough in my first draft. And as I begin to look at other people's scripts as well as view media, I've now come to understand yes, this is how keep in mind how the character would act in certain scenarios. I had to think of scenarios of how let's say Althea would act or how this other character would act. Conflict is always interesting and it sounds like you have conflict right off the bat here. Do you think that's necessary to, to drive your story forward? Yeah, depending on what the conflict is, it can be interesting. The conflict in Black Rhapsody literally starts on a humorous note to end in a very horrific note. Do you find humor and horror can work hand in hand? It depends on how well you've executed. I've seen mm -hmm. horror movies that can like, have a bit of humorous moments or unintentional humorous moments. There was that movie with Kirsten Stewart about her being a, a scientist underwater. It basically had Cthulhu, oh my god, I the name of it. It had Cthulhu in it. Yeah. And Cthulhu's reaction to getting blown up, despite it being a horror movie, was so funny. I'll have to look up that film. <laughs> yeah, it's Cthulhu like, oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> well, that's new. Uh, who knew you could blow apart an elder god like that with just, you know, C4 and whatever else was in on hand? Yeah. People would be sending in left and right and make it into a game show or something. How to blow up Cthulhu. <laughs> <laughs> if you could turn this comic into maybe a live action version, speaking of films, you know, 
who do you think would be cast for your two main protagonist and antagonist characters? Uh, that's the thing. I will never have this cat be a live action film. I know what happens when Hollywood producer tries to adapt in manga or anime. Look at Death Note. Look at Cowboy Bop. <laughs> I'm never going to have it be live action. It's going to be animated. It would be awesome animated for sure. If for some reason, maybe you had actors as voice actors then for your characters, who would you have? Oh, okay. I had an actor in mind. I'm sorry, I'm about to quickly look her up. And she sounded close to what I, uh, I would have said um, the chick from Life is Strange that played Chloe from Life is Strange. Oh, yeah. yeah. Ashley first or Kennedy Ray, because they sound the closest to Althea. Oh, dude, Sabella. Oh, God. I, I'm sorry, because I am not there remembering actresses' names. That's okay. But I remember listening to her demo reel a few months back. She had this very snooty and uptight way of playing the character. Oh my god, I am never gonna remember this time. We got we got one out of the two, that's perfectly fine. I remember I contacted one of them. Uh yes, but it was two actually, Ben Vox and Empress Lila. I think they were like the closest characters to how um Dulcie Bella sounded in my head, especially Empress Lila, upper class snooty. Mm-hmm doesn't care about your feelings type of woman that Ducebella is. What was the first thing that you wrote as, as a writer that made you realize, yes, I could do this as a career? Uh, it would have to be, um, I think it was an assignment for my college class where I had to write from the, per- I think it was the perspective of an object for an assignment. My teacher had pulled me aside. I, I remember my professor pulled me aside I said, Serena, that was amazing. You should consider doing this for your final project. Because we all have to um, write some type of piece for a project. It could be like from the voice of an object or character or kind of our own made up story. One of the creative writing electives I was taking at the time. That sounds like a fun, fun experiment. <laughs> yeah. Professor told me that I should consider like doing character-oriented pieces. And that led to your creation of this comic, or was that later on down the road? That was later on down the road. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? I have to go way, way back. But like, it was, I think, in the high school, we were reading a book called Water for Chocolate. It was the first time that I was introduced to a genre called magical realism. Are you familiar with that story, that series? No. I, could you give us a, a brief summary about it? Oh, yeah. It basically takes place in, like, a South American country. And it, it centers around, like, this family of women where the youngest daughter has to take care of her mother and can't be with her true love. And the, and the eldest daughter has to get married and ends up marrying the youngest daughter's true love and having a kid with him. So it's more of like a... I think it was Mexican family drama, like mm-hmm. thinking cantable without the magical elements. And I remember the way that things were described in that book was like so exaggerated that it came across as fantastical. Example, there was a scene in which the grandmother, this was like the character, the main character's birth. The grandmother started to crown. She was in the process of going into labor and like it described her water breaking as being like a literal flood in the household she literally flooded the house and i'm like wait did that legitimately happen or that just exaggerated it was, it was hard to discern like certain things in the story it was more for like you know sub visual effect as you were reading it type deal yeah that's the thing about the magical realism genre like it's fantasy, but it's not. It's fantasy, but it's too cowardly to go like full into the fantastical elements. That's how I always describe it. And I just remember being like very annoyed because I couldn't, I couldn't differentiate what was the fantasy aspect, what was the exaggeration aspect. They turned it into a film, and the film kind of helped a bit. But at the same time, I think the book was a bit better because it left it up to the audience's imagination. The way the film like tackled it. It made it seem like it was like almost fantasy. I don't know. This genre is just weird. I'm trying to think of any other mainstream films that have kind of gone that route. 
and there might be a couple i could you could almost say to a certain extent that hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy the film version at least was uh had touches of that i never watched hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy i wouldn't know but all i think i know that Yes, it was very pretty and interesting how the book conveyed certain images and certain characters' feelings, but at the same time, it felt very wishy-washy to me. Like, it was using a lot of this fantastical language and elements, but it didn't feel like it was going in with it. Like, the story was an autobiography, but it was an autobiography that had these, like, weird, fantastical, almost fantastical elements. It just irritated me. Looking at, then, more of a literary approach, what is, especially when it comes to manga and... Uh, in anime uh, what's an underappreciated manga or, or anime that you watched early on that you didn't quite get but later on in life you thought that it was it was amazing uh oh gosh there was so many <laughs> oh god i'm sorry this is gonna like i have to literally go through my entire i was say inuyasha mm-hmm <laughs> As a kid, I didn't get that. I don't know. I, I only watched because I would want to. I really like the um, ending songs <laughs> of Inuyasha. It wasn't until I was uh, an adult that I kind of started to appreciate for what it was, though it's still kind of flawed because it does fall into the stereotypical shoujo trappings and certain writing decisions, like characters' decisions, didn't really make sense to me. There's a couple that I, I started and never actually finished. Have you have you ever done that before in a series where either maybe time or just the characters weren't interesting, but then later on it was like everyone says you should be watching? Yeah, I've been in that situation before. I was like that with big O as well as Death Note. Death Note especially, because I remember it came on during the early 2000s. Mm-hmm. And the, the anime, I met, not the mm-hmm. manga. I never checked out the manga. It's just something that never interests me. My dad was into it. I, I'm just not into like crime thrillers like that. It wasn't until years later where people, I started seeing YouTube videos about it that people like was praising it for his like, like smart writing. I remember watching the anime as well. And the manga is apparently way better than the anime as as they usually are sometimes it depends it wasn't until the last two episodes that it was really good and then the last two episodes they just it just fell flat i have a feeling they um animated it while the manga was still writing not uncommon for um certain anime to do that what is your creative kryptonite outside like outside interference or it's hard for me to write and listen to things or watch things at the same time. Um, I am not a good multitasker. Sometimes I accidentally incorporate what I watch into my writing, which doesn't make sense for the um, character or the scene I'm writing. Because that was something that did happen in my um, first draft. Like I, I can only function in science, so I can't like listen to a podcast as well as write at the same time. At what point are we good enough? I don't think there's going to be a point where you're ever good enough. You're always going to be wondering, can you uh, improve upon this? Can you improve upon that? I'm assuming your modest apparandi, the work that you're well known as a writer, is the point where people think you're good enough. But I've seen plenty of writers think the complete opposite. Look at anything Alan Moore ever writes. I think for me, it's Neil Gaiman. He's just so prolific in many different areas it's it's amazing i never read anything by neil gaiman he has a way with words uh him and stephen fry stephen fry is mainly known for like sherlock holmes the new the new sherlock holmes and all that stuff but he has an an extensive knowledge of of mythology and neil gaiman is just his sandman series alone if you ever get a chance to pick any of that up is incredible he, he just opens your eyes to a whole, whole other avenue of fantasy and the merging of many different cultures as well, too. Mm. What is something that everyone should experience once in their lifetime? I think some people nowadays have not experienced failure and have thus developed egos, thinking their work are, is better than, they, than it actually is. Well, some creators just need to be um, humbled. Has that happened recently? There are way too many examples that I can think of. Um, I know some creators that need to understand that you need an editor. Don't just publish a book without an editor. 
because chances are it's not going to be good. It's going to have a lot of errors, which it usually does. You're not on that level yet. You still need some form of assistance to bring your book and story all together. How do you think the birth of creativity was formed? It's different for most people. Some people become creatives early in life through reading stories or writing their own little um, fanfics. Some people became um, creatives later on in life after they gained enough of the understanding of storytelling or they consume like um, certain types of me are able to discern what it what works it doesn't work in a story. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? For me, it was multiple different people. Some create some independent creative that I know, and some independent creative founders that are, I'll say, professional level. From a writing standpoint, um, Dan Mendoza who was the creator of Zombie Trump and uh, what was his other book? Sad Girl, Psycho Baby, Stepan Sajic, uh, the creator of Sunstone and numerous other works. He's a fantastic writer and knows how to do interpersonal relationships and dialogue very well. From like a lone indie scene um, standpoint, I would say uh, your boy, Zach, and his project, he's a YouTuber. He goes by the name um, Comics Matters, I think. He, he used to be called your boy, Zach. I forgot the name of his great, I think it was great, no, great worship. He, he's an indie comic creator. He has like, he's not well known in the mainstream. And to see his project be successful on Indiegogo is kind of what inspired me to go through with with Black Rhapsody and putting down Indiegogo. Because I always thought that as an independent creator, you needed to go through the big publishers mm. like DC, Image, Dark Horse, Marvel. Because that's like, I will probably give up on ever creating Black Rhapsody because I didn't think any of the um, publishers would be interested in it. But after seeing like YouTubers turn comic creators fund their books through Indiegogo, that kind of inspired me to go through with um, the project. From a professional standpoint, you have created a comic. It is currently being completed. Professionally, you know, congratulations, you you are successful. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Yes, I was, I was able to um, get my book funded within a few, few days. That's like unheard of for like a first timer. And I accumulate, I was able to accumulate a total of 709 signups for my first project. Yeah, I literally had to utilize Twitter in order to get to that number. Like most of my signups and backers came from Twitter. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I take, I usually take the advice from others and try to get back on my feet or try to change things that didn't work the first time. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a, a comic writer or, or a creative person in their own right and whatever they would like to be creatively. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I would say for young and upcoming creators, try to consume media, good media with interesting and fantastic writing. Don't just consume schlock because that can have an effect on your writing which what happened to me in my first draft, unfortunately. Make sure you get an editor. Editors save lives. Editors' lives matter because editors, they, they, they know what they're doing. They know how to pretty up your script. And you may get discouraged the first time or the first two times. I should say first three times for me. But understand that it's for the betterment of your project and for the betterment of your yourself as a writer. Well, I do hate to say this, Serena, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Uh, before I let you go, where can we find you and how can we support you online and on the internet? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Magic Almedia. I'm very active there. Or in the chats of some YouTubers. I go by Miss Serena on YouTube. Or I'm in the YouTube chats. 
Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. And of course, on our YouTube channel, which is uh, a lot more updated than our website because I'm only one person, which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening watching on Two Geeks Talking.